Greetings and welcome back, gentles and ladies, to another installment of the Dreamcast Era Sonic Marathon. I'm Exo Paradigm Gamer, and it's finally time to talk about Sonic Adventure 2. Reviewing this game is one of the reasons I became a video game reviewer in the first place. It's become increasingly obvious to me since 2012 that if I don't stand up for Sonic Adventure 2 and address all the arguments against it, then people are just going to continue to take them for granted. So, let's do things like Oprah and get this fucker started. Shortly after the release and success of the first Sonic Adventure game on the Dreamcast, Sonic Team began development on a direct sequel, with the goal of making something more fast-paced and action-oriented than the first. By the time the game came out in June of 2001, however, it had become apparent that the Dreamcast wasn't doing as well as intended. Sega began hemorrhaging from some considerable financial problems before discontinuing the Dreamcast and leaving the console market altogether. Thus, Sonic Adventure 2 was the last first-party game released on the Sega Dreamcast, and for the time, it was considered a good game to go out on. Even IGN liked it. While the quality standard of 3D Sonic has always been a matter of debate, Sonic Adventure 2 was once considered something of a diamond in the rough. While adventure and heroes have always had their fans, the common opinion used to be that Sonic Adventure 2 was an overall more polished title, and proved that 3D Sonic could be done and done well. The tides began to shift in 2012, after the game's digital re-release, which gave critics a chance to reminisce on the game's quality in light of over 10 years of mixed 3D Sonic releases. Perhaps most seminal for many Sonic fans was a 40 minute review by popular YouTuber Some Call Me Johnny, who offered a more negative perspective of the game than was common among many fans at the time, and arguing that Sonic Adventure 2 was not as good as Sonic Adventure 1. Before Mr. Ortiz's review, I knew of very few people who argued that SA1 was the better game, but nowadays pretty much everyone does. So yeah, I think it's fair to say that this video made an impact. Since then, other big reviewers have done nothing but parrot Mr. Ortiz's original arguments. I want to make a few things clear right here and now. First, I am not making this video to shame or attack content creators or people who do not like Sonic Adventure 2 or those who merely prefer the first game. We all like or dislike games for reasons that make sense to us as individuals, so I consider both opinions to be legitimate. Second, I will not argue that Sonic Adventure 2 is a perfect game or that it does not deserve justifiable criticism. Trust me, I have my own gripes that I will gladly discuss. Third, by offering counter-arguments to claims raised by other fans or reviewers, it is not my intention to be vengeful or vindictive. When a set of claims becomes ideologized and taken for granted, it is not illegitimate to push back and question the substance of said claims. My intention is to broaden the Sonic Adventure 2 debate and allow people to consider things they may not have otherwise. I hope that by treating this matter with politeness and respect, you lovely folks will do the same. I hope. What this review is really about is defending those of us, however plenty or few we may be, who still unironically enjoy Sonic Adventure 2. The fact of the matter is that the Sonic community has become increasingly hostile to fans of SA2 since 2012, and many people seem content with exaggerating what SA2 does wrong and ignoring the many things it does right. While Sonic Adventure 2 is not a perfect game, I am still convinced that it is nonetheless a good one, as well as an improvement over its predecessor. In case you're curious about the GameCube and digital versions, I'd like to remind the folks at home that I will be doing a short, combined episode of ROR after I finish Heroes. For now, I just want to review the game itself, and judging by the timestamp, I've got plenty to say about that. Without further ado, this is Sonic Adventure 2 for the Sega Dreamcast. Let's kick things off by discussing the plot. As in my Adventure 1 video, I'm sure that many of you have likely seen many reviews of this game before, so I'm going to keep things as minimalistic as possible. After reading an entry in his grandfather's diary, Dr. Eggman breaks into a military facility on Prison Island and unleashes the base's top secret weapon, a black hedgehog named Shadow. To reward Eggman for releasing him, Shadow leads him to the Space Colony Ark, where he informs Eggman that the colony possesses a doomsday laser known as the Eclipse Cannon. By collecting the seven Chaos Emeralds, Eggman can unleash its power and hold the world hostage. A bat named Rouge overhears the conversation and volunteers to help Eggman and Shadow find the Emeralds in exchange for Eggman's Emerald Radar. As the villains attempt to make off with the Chaos Emeralds, Shadow is mistaken taken for Sonic by law enforcement, leading the latter to be locked up in military prison. Tails and Amy bust him out, only to discover Eggman's plan for world domination. Later joined by Knuckles, Sonic and friends head for outer space to foil Eggman's schemes. Overall, it's not that different from Sonic 2's plot. The Doctor is trying to collect the Chaos Emeralds to power a space station shaped like his face, and Sonic and friends are trying to stop him. It's basic, cliched, and straightforward. And for a Sonic game, that's all I need. The only time things get more convoluted is during the last story segment 
segment, with one cutscene generating some admittedly eyebrow-raising plot holes. Still, none of these plot holes are so egregious as to ruin the plot as a whole. As with its predecessor, many people have criticized SA2's story presentation, noting the awkward mocap animations, Japanese-only lip-syncing, cheesy voice acting, and amateur writing. Once again, I would like to note that for a game released in early 2001, Sonic Adventure 2's storytelling is more or less within the quality standard of the times. A few months after SA2's release, games like Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, and Metal Gear Solid 2 would drastically raise the bar for video game storytelling, making both adventure games look obsolete in comparison. When the Dreamcast Sonic games were originally released, however, the quality standard was still dictated by contemporary classics such as Resident Evil, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and Star Fox 64. If those games could get away with having bad story presentations, then why can't Sonic Adventure 2? Like I said last time, it's a game about a blue hedgehog who collects rings and runs through loop-de-loops. How good did the voice acting and vocalization need to be for the game itself to be good? Disliking the story is fine, but using it as the singular grounds for dismissing the overall quality of a platforming game is not good form. Even if the story isn't spectacular, I still think it's a sizable improvement over Adventure 1's. Unlike that game, which told a rather convoluted story through six interconnected arcs in the last story segment, Sonic Adventure 2's story is told through only three. A hero scenario, a dark scenario, and a last story segment. Needless to say, the plot's a lot more straightforward than last time, and the fact that you don't have to rewatch the same cutscenes up to four times also makes repeat playthroughs a lot more bearable. Sure, there are a handful of repeat cutscenes, but these only play twice at most, and you can skip any cutscene in any version of the game. There are also only three unskippable credit sequences as opposed to seven. Still too many, but not nearly as bad. While the story presentation is definitely dated, it's still made some strides since the previous game, at least by Dreamcast standards. While the motion capture animations look rather stiff by today's standards, I still think they're a lot more dynamic and engaging than the ones in Adventure 1. On top of that, it's nice to watch cutscenes where the characters are physically expressive and move around, whereas last time, Sonic and friends just stood in place with looping stock animations. The facial animations also look a lot less distracting, and though the lip syncing does doesn't match the English dialogue, and at least manages that to look somewhat more rough. convincing. The cutscenes themselves are better paced as well, without all the awkward pauses that plagued the previous game. Boy, you're lucky I saw you come down! So what went wrong anyway? It's not like you to crash like that! Yeah, it's just that I'm testing a new prototype power supply, and it's not fully compatible yet. Now I know what's going on! The military has mistaken me for the likes of you! So, where do you think you're going with that emerald? Say something, you fake hedgehog! Some Sonic fans have accused Adventure 2's storyline of taking itself too seriously, which is kind of ridiculous to me. The opening cutscene of the Hero Side story shows Sonic jumping off of a plane on a makeshift snowboard while cracking jokes about airline food. Most of the character interactions are filled with goofy, light-hearted quips and ironically funny moments, like this part where Eggman just randomly scratches his ass. While the quality of the voice acting was somewhat more consistent in Adventure 1, the goofy delivery of some lines here helps to maintain a proper tone. Perhaps that wasn't how the game intended to present itself, but Sonic Adventure 2 doesn't come off as though it's taking itself seriously at all. It certainly has moments of tension, but so did Sonic Adventure 1. The only part of the game that perhaps takes itself too seriously is the last story segment, but even that's mostly an excuse for the characters to team up for the greater good. The vast majority of the game is lighthearted like Sonic should be. Overall, Sonic Adventure 2's plot is more straightforward, less obtrusive, and better presented than Adventure 1's. It's not a good plot, but it works for what it's trying to do and doesn't get in the way as much as it could have. Let's move on to the aesthetics. As the last first party release on the Sega Dreamcast, Sonic Adventure 2 is one of the best looking games on the system. Nothing sticks out as particularly blocky or badly textured like Eggman was in the first game. The fact that Eggman actually has a mouth is more than I could say about last time, and the character models in general just look a lot better constructed. Some
Some of the enemy models can look slightly blocky, but seeing as they're robots and you never see them up close, that's acceptable. When it comes to art direction, Sonic Adventure 2 largely follows its predecessor. The character designs of Sonic and Friends look more or less like they did last time, and they're animated pretty well during gameplay. Sonic Adventure 2 also features some nicely textured environments, which feature smooth level geometry and plenty of visual variety. Not to mention, a lot of these levels are pretty memorable. Anyone who's played this game remembers Pumpkin Hill and City Escape. My only criticism of the environments is that many of them take place indoors or at night, which limits the color palette somewhat. In general though, I consider Sonic Adventure 2 to be a decent improvement in terms of graphics and presentation. While you can still tell the game was made in the early 2000s, Sonic Adventure 2's visuals hold up pretty well for the most part. That being said, how does the soundtrack compare to last time? The general consensus is that it's not as good as Sonic Adventure 1's, and I'd be inclined to agree. Still, I wouldn't say that's enough to make the first game better as a whole. That's like saying Sonic 2 is better than Sonic 3 Knuckles just because Sonic 2 debatably has a better soundtrack. You gotta look at the game design too. While Sonic Adventure 2's soundtrack may not be as good as its predecessor, it's still very much up to snuff with the rest of the series, and there is a decent amount of variety. Beyond cutscenes, which feature arranged event music, each character in Sonic Adventure 2 features his or her own musical motif, ranging from rock and roll to hip-hop and even sex music. The character themes are also pretty good, whether it be new material or songs remixed from Adventure 1. The game's main theme, Live and Learn by Crush 40, is among their best work in the whole series. It's simply godly. While it's not the best, Sonic Adventure 2's soundtrack is still well within the series' musical quality standard. With all my thoughts on the story and aesthetics more or less out of the way, it's time to get into the gameplay. In general, Sonic Adventure Adventure 2's gameplay is similar to that of its predecessor. In order to finish the game, you'll have to take control of 6 playable characters to conquer the game's 30 stages. Unlike the previous game, Adventure 2 only retains 3 of the 6 gameplay styles from last time, action speed stages, mech shooting stages, and treasure hunting stages. Because characters are grouped into dark and hero scenarios, you'll rotate between playstyles as the game progresses. On top of this, hub worlds are nowhere to be seen. You just go from stage to stage and that's it. Between this and the rotating playstyle, Sonic Adventure Adventure 2's gameplay feels much better paced than last time around, where hour-long doses of characters like Big or Amy could really overstay their welcome. Before I dig into the playstyles proper, it's worth addressing a popular argument in the Sonic community, that only one-third of Sonic Adventure 2's gameplay was any good, whereas one half of Sonic Adventure 1's gameplay was good. These statistics are based on some frankly flawed arithmetic, arguing that something is only good if you enjoyed 100% of it all the time, ignoring the moments you may have enjoyed along the way. The fact of the matter is that any Sonic gameplay style has its ups and downs, so calling only one third of Sonic Adventure 2 good because of a handful of bad moments or levels suggests that game quality is all or nothing and ignores its true fluidity. It seems these oversimplifications have their roots in some Sonic fans' personal preference as to what makes for good Sonic gameplay. While many individuals have made some lucid observations as to why they did or did not enjoy certain playstyles, it still seems to me that many people are are more offended by the fact that they have to play multiple gameplay styles than they are offended by the execution of the individual gameplay styles themselves. Hence the one third good statistic I'm so sick of hearing. Yes, Sonic Team shouldn't just do whatever the hell they want, but the series can afford some experimentation so long as the gameplay is fun and generally loyal to the mechanics and stylings of the Sonic franchise. As in my last review, I'd argue that the essential elements of a good Sonic gameplay style are thus. One, the character should be reasonably fast. Two, there should be an emphasis on platforming. Three, there should be familiar Sonic set pieces like rings, springs, and robots. And four, completing an objective should be straightforward and simple. The question then is how well Sonic Adventure 2 invokes these elements. Let's kick things off with the action speed stages, featuring Sonic and Shadow. The gameplay is largely the same as Sonic's scenario from Adventure 1, to guide Sonic and Shadow to the goal ring while defeating enemies, collecting rings, and avoiding bottomless pits. In general, Sonic and Shadow control just as well, if not even slightly better than they did last time. The control is precise while not being too precise, and the Hedgehog's acceleration is gradual enough to avoid feeling slippery. Both characters can get going at pretty high speeds, and the inclusion of more over-the-top set pieces helps to really sell this sense of speed. All of Sonic's abilities from the first game return here, along with the new Somersault move, which is used to break open crates, enter small passages, and defeat certain enemies. Some have argued that this ability neuters the Spin Dash, but the Spin Dash can still be used effectively by simply holding 
down the button. New and old upgrades return as well, though this time they're found within stages and are overall better incorporated into the level design. Every few stages or so you'll come across a boss battle. There were a few decent bosses in the first game, but most of them ranged from boring and drawn out to absolutely pathetically easy. While SA2's boss fights can still leave something to be desired, they do generally offer more challenge and satisfaction. For one thing, character battles last longer than 15 seconds, and your opponents will actually dodge your attacks and force you to develop a strategy. The mech shooting bosses require more than standing in place and mashing the shoot button, for example. Not all of the bosses are great, but even the worst ones are at least inoffensive. There are a few repeat bosses, but they at least bother to use different attacks depending on the character, unlike Adventure 1. There is one moderately annoying boss in the last story segment, but I wouldn't call it much worse than the final boss of Sonic's arc in Adventure 1. Overall, the boss battles are somewhat improved over Sonic Adventure 1, and I think a lot of people like to forget that. When it comes to level design, Adventure 2 has seen a change of direction and one that often provokes outcry in the fan community. In Sonic Adventure 1, all six characters shared 11 stages, which were designed so that multiple characters could play them. While this worked well for the most part, some level areas could occasionally feel shoehorned in as a result. Sonic Adventure 2, in contrast, features 30 unique stages that are played by one character alone. The result is level design that is tailored to a specific character's playstyle, bringing out the most depth in said character. The greater stage count also gives Adventure 2 more production value. Some people have complained that while Adventure 2 has more levels, many of them often share similar themes and set pieces. But these same people are apparently fine with the classic Sonic games having multiple acts in a zone. Even so, having 30 unique stages that share some design elements is still better than recycling 11 stages multiple times. So, what does this new level design mean for Sonic and Shadow? A lot of Sonic fans have argued that these stages are not as good as Adventure 1's because they're more linear and have less of an exploration element. To this, I ask sincerely whether Sonic stages in the last game were really that much more open-ended. When you sit down and compare the two level sets, I think you'll find that they're both pretty linear, especially when you compare them to the classics. Sure, some SA2 levels like Pyramid Cave or Radical Highway are relatively linear, but so are Windy Valley and Emerald Coast in SA1. Adventure 2's level design is definitely more straightforward, but that doesn't necessarily make it bad, and a lot of people take that for granted. Many fans like to point out that Adventure 1 had hidden ring boxes, ignoring the fact that Adventure 2 does the exact same thing. In fact, coming back to previous levels with the Mystic Melody or other upgrades actually opens up new pathways in areas of the level that weren't accessible before, as well as hidden optional upgrades within stages that encourage further exploration. Compared to the classics, Adventure 2 is definitely not as open-ended as it could have been. But I will disagree that the game's level design lacks any open-endedness or exploration factor whatsoever. Even if the levels are more linear, how is that a bad thing exactly? That's entirely a matter of personal taste, not an objective law of Sonic game design. That's not to say that all of the speed stages are 100% perfect. Shadow's last stage, Final Chase, sees the manifestation of edginess platforming around a bunch of spinning platforms with a janky gravity gimmick. Needless to say, I died more than a few times on this level even 11 years after I first played this game. I'm willing to agree that Final Chase is one of the worst levels in the game, but the likes of Radical Highway, Green Forest, Rail Canyon, and City Escape are pretty damn fun. In summary, Sonic and Shadow's speed stages are a really fun portion of Sonic Adventure 2, and in my opinion, an improvement over Sonic's scenario in Adventure 1. Like any good Sonic gameplay style, the characters move reasonably fast, there's a good amount of platforming, all the familiar set pieces are here and accounted for, and finishing stages is straightforward and simple. Cap that off with some great level design and better implemented upgrades, and you've got yourself a great time. That being said, let's move on to the mech shooting stages, starring Tails and Dr. Eggman. Their gameplay is very comparable to E-102 Gamma's. The goal is to guide Tails or Dr. Eggman, who are piloting the Tornado 2 and the Egg Walker respectively, to the goal ring at the end of the stage while blowing the fuck out of everything in sight. Many Sonic fans like to argue that the mechs have clunkier controls than Gamma did in Adventure 1. Let's not forget that Gamma's control wasn't perfect either. He would turn on a dime even at high speeds, meaning that his control could get rather slippery. Regardless, fans of SA1 have greatly exaggerated the supposed clunkiness of the mech controls. The mechs differ from Gamma in that the upper and lower portions swivel separately, meaning that it takes a little while for the legs to catch up with the cockpit. Presumably, Sonic Team did this to make the mech controls less slippery than Gamma while still giving the player the freedom to spin around and aim at enemies. The downside to this is that the turning of the mechs is wider and takes a little longer than Gamma did. The jumping also feels a little less floaty than Gamma did in the last game. If you're used to playing as Gamma, then you'll understandably find the mechs a little stiff in comparison. But is it as unpleasant?
unplayably clunky as some Sonic fans will have you believe? Absolutely not. For one thing, the levels are designed with this new control in mind, and the controls aren't so stiff that I found myself constantly falling off of platforms. Second, using the hover upgrades, which you get early on, helps to alleviate any issues with platforming. Finally, while the mechs are slower than Gamma, they're still capable of going reasonably fast when you're given the chance, and the slightly lower speed is very much conducive to the level design you're given. In sum, while the mech controls are slightly stiffer than Gamma's, they're nowhere near as unplayably awkward awkward or clunky as many Sonic fans will have you believe. Similar to Gamma stages, Tails and Eggman can use a homing laser to lock onto up to 12 enemies and rack up combo bonuses. Unlike last time, however, there's no timer, so you're really only racking up points for the A rank, which is a much more worthwhile incentive in my book. Tails and Eggman now sport a life bar, which is decreased by enemy fire and can be replenished by collecting rings or first aid boxes. Upgrades will increase the firepower and defense of the mechs to help you rack up your score faster. While it may seem like the life bar makes things easier, Enemies and bosses are a lot more aggressive now than they were in Gamma Scenario, which makes for overall more challenging levels. As with the speed stages, the mech shooting stages are relatively straightforward in design, just like Gamma stages were in the last game. Unlike Gamma stages, however, there are more alternate paths to take, more hidden ring boxes and optional upgrades to encourage exploration, and also hidden areas accessible only with the Mystic Melody. There's a lot more depth to Tails and Eggman stages than there was with Gamma's. As the platforming is a lot more involved, enemies actually put up a fight, and the occasional puzzle elements are more pronounced. One of Tails' stages sees our favorite fox chasing after the president's limousine in a go-kartified Tornado 2. Rouge the Bat has a similar stage in the Dark Side scenario, where she drives a 1986 Polar White Phallus Wagon. Think of it as this game's version of the Sky Chase subgame. My one complaint with these stages is that the accelerator and the drift are both mapped to the same button, whereas there are plenty of other buttons to choose from. Still, it's nothing that kills the control or the experience. Overall, these go-kart levels ain't half bad. They're long enough to be worthwhile, while not so long as to overstay their welcome. You also unlock go-kart stages in the multiplayer for clearing them, so there's that too. Anyways, I can't say I understand why it is that people dislike the mech shooting stages. They're fast-paced, well-designed, and really fun to play. Are people seriously telling me they'd rather play as Amy or Big, characters who lack depth and belonging respectively? A certain reviewer seems convinced that these levels are bad because you shoot things, but that's not an argument, it's an opinion. A lot of people have expressed disappointment that Tails isn't playable outside of his mech, and that Eggman is only controllable in the Eggwalker. While I understand these concerns, I can't help but feel that these are little more than nitpicks. Another criticism involves the camera, which I think is more or less as good as it was in Adventure 1. Once again, you can turn it left and right with the corresponding triggers, and because of the more straightforward design of most levels, it's almost always pointing where you want it to go. There were certainly moments where the camera angle could have been better, but they were just that. Moments. The overwhelming majority of the time, Adventure 2's camera is perfectly functional. To give credit to those Sonic fans out there who don't like the mech shooting stages, the last tail stage in the game, Eternal Engine, is pretty frustrating. Enemies seem to ambush you way too often, accidentally destroying these dynamite packs can get you sucked into space, and there's one part where you have to take a leap of faith and then fight the camera to press a switch and destroy some cages. A lot of the criticisms I've heard people make of this playstyle are only really evident in this level, those being bad enemy placement and poor camera angles. But Eternal Engine is the absolute worst the mech shooting gameplay ever gets. Stages like Mission Street, Cosmic Wall, Hidden Base, and Lost Colony are all polished, well-designed levels that are enjoyable to play. Overall, Tails and Eggman's mech shooting stages are a highly enjoyable part of Sonic Adventure 2, and an improvement over Gamma's gameplay from last time. The mechs move reasonably fast and control well, there's a lot of great platforming, all the familiar set pieces are here and accounted for, and finishing stages is as simple as getting to the end. Cap that off with some improved level design and better implemented upgrades, and you've got yourself a great Sonic gameplay style. That leaves us with the third and final play style, treasure hunting with Knuckles and Rouge. Am I the only one who finds it ironic that the same people who hate the speed stages for being too linear are the same people who hate the treasure hunting stages for not being linear? You can't have your cake and eat it too. Nonetheless, Knuckles and Rouge are unquestionably the weakest part of this game. Treasure hunting is mostly similar to the way it was in Knuckles scenario in the last game. The goal is to climb and glide your way around the stage to find three MacGuffins while defeating enemies, collecting rings, and avoiding bottomless pits. Knuckles and Rouge handled just as well as Knuckles did last time, and make use of the same abilities and upgrades as before. They can run about as fast as Sonic and Shadow, climbing and gliding feels intuitive, and romping about the stages is still streamlined. While stages are generally bigger than before, the radar and hint systems return to help the player find their way around, and it's here that we find two of the major gripes people have about treasure hunting. In the first adventure game, 
the radar would beep for all three MacGuffins at once. In this game, the radar will only help you locate one at a time, though there's nothing preventing you from collecting them out of order if you happen to find them along the way. While I will agree that this wasn't the best design choice, I wholeheartedly disagree that it ruins the entire playstyle. While the new radar does result in stages taking longer, most of the time stages can be beaten in about 5 minutes, which I think is perfectly reasonable. Key word being most of the time. Truth is, stage length is contingent on RNG. Depending on where the MacGuffins spawn, levels can be beaten in about 2 minutes or drag out to 6 or more. A lot of people don't like that, and I don't necessarily blame them. Thankfully, there's a full-blown hint system to help you out if you find things are taking too long. Scattered throughout stages are hint monitors, which will give you hints as to the location of the current MacGuffin. Personally, I think the hint system is a lot better than last time, where Tikal just told you where to go and took all the steam out of exploring, which is the whole point of the playstyle. If you have no idea where to go, just talk to a hint monitor and it will give you a nudge in the right direction. If that's not enough, you can get up to two more hints for a single MacGuffin, the third of which will tell you exactly where it is. A lot of people like to complain that the hint system is useless because it decreases your rank, but they're only half right. I used three separate hints in Death Chamber and still got an A rank on my first try. What matters most for ranking purposes is how fast you find the emeralds, not how many hints you use. I also question why it is that people seem so concerned about what rank they get when they don't even like this playstyle to begin with. That's like saying Bayonetta, another Sega franchise, sucks because using support items makes it harder to get a platinum trophy. The fact that you're not good enough at the game to get the optional best rank is not the game's fault. It's almost like people want to make this game look bad or something. <coughs> <clears throat> anyway, it is true that hints aren't always super helpful, but they are better than nothing. And if you find that these stages are taking too long, you're only shooting yourself in the foot by choosing not to use the hint system. Beyond the radar and the hint system, the biggest complaint people have about Knuckles and Rouge is that the levels are just too big. Let me be clear when I say that treasure hunting stages are no doubt the least well designed in the game, but they're nowhere near as bad as people often make them out to be. There are only really three stages in the entire game that feel significantly larger than those in Adventure 1. Pumpkin Hill, Meteor Herd, and Mad Space. All the other treasure hunting stages are about as big as Red Mountain and Speed Highway were in the first game. Even in the bigger levels, navigating a stage really isn't that bad. Each features conspicuous set pieces to help you get your bearings, your characters are capable of getting from one end to the other relatively quickly, and the hint and radar systems will help you get pointed in the right direction. Because of this, I find that most of the treasure hunting stages are inoffensive at worst. Still, there are two stages that I'm not going to defend, Security Hall and Mad Space. The first imposes a deadly combination of a strict time limit and uncooperative RNG, while the second bends you over with wonky gravity gimmick and annoying set pieces. Controlling the camera in stages like Egg Quarters, Aquatic Mine, and Death Chamber can also be mildly annoying but that's really the worst I can say about them. Every other stage is perfectly fine, even if they can be on the bigger side sometimes. So that's two bad stages, three mildly annoying ones, and four stages that are inoffensive at worst. All things considered, that's not the worst thing ever. In conclusion, Treasure Hunting with Knuckles and Rouge is generally a decent gameplay style, though it's definitely the weakest in the game and could have used some more fine tuning during development. The radar should have stayed the way it was, some levels are a little on the beefy side, and other stages have some stupid design elements. Regardless, it's more than tolerable if you're willing to give it a chance, and it fulfills all the conditions of a good Sonic playstyle. The characters are reasonably fast, there's plenty of platforming, all the familiar set pieces are there, and collecting MacGuffins remains straightforward, if not a little slower thanks to the radar and hint systems. Even considering their flaws, Knuckles and Rouge are still more fun to play as than Bigger Amy, which dragged on for approximately two hours of Adventure 1 with cutscenes. I can't help but feel that the the only reason people prefer Adventure 1's treasure hunting was because those levels required less effort on the player's part. Since when was it bad game design to require the player to put a reasonable amount of effort into what he or she is doing? If you dislike playing as Knuckles and Rouge, that's perfectly fine and I'll respect your opinion. At the same time, I'd argue that this gameplay is actually kind of underrated. Having discussed all the gameplay styles in depth, it's clear to me that Sonic Adventure 2 possesses a good, if mildly inconsistent quality standard, and that the one 
their good statistic is nowhere close to accurate. Out of the whole game, I can think of only four levels that are decisively bad. Security Hall, Mad Space, Final Chase, and Eternal Engine. Each of the remaining 27 stages are perfectly fine, though some of them can have annoying moments. By my calculations then, approximately 87% of the main gameplay is good, which roughly translates to about 5 sixths. All things considered, that's not bad at all. After all, Big and Amy made up 7 stages in Adventure 1. Once again, I can't help but feel that people's issues with mech shooting and treasure hunting are based more on the fact that they have to play them than they are in the gameplay styles themselves. When judged on their own merits, all three gameplay styles are well within the range of what I would consider good Sonic game design. With the main gameplay more or less out of the way, it's worth chatting about some of the side quests. Like its predecessor, Sonic Adventure 2 has a lot of optional content. Returning from Adventure 1 are emblems, which you win after completing a mission for the first time, as well as a stage select mode, which allows you to replay any of the game's 30 stages as well as the Chow Garden at any time. Playing the level select mode allows you to revisit old stages with new equipment to find some useful and not so useful hidden upgrades. Like Adventure 1, all 30 stages, including the go-kart stages, also feature 4 extra missions you can play that add new objectives and challenge to older stages. One of these missions, the Chow mission, tasks you with exploring every cranny and nook of each stage for a hidden Chow. The people who complain that the stages in this game have no exploration factor clearly didn't play the Chow missions. The Chow Garden also returns, but it's not something I really know well enough to spend time talking about in this video. I will say that I disagree with the people who claim it's the only good part of Adventure 2, because, and I'm sorry to say this, that's frankly one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. In order to get all 180 emblems in the game and unlock the secret hidden level, you'll have to complete all 5 missions in each stage, sink a considerable amount of time into the Chow Garden, and earn an A rank in all 155 missions. As I alluded to earlier, Sonic Adventure 2 introduces a ranking system to the series. Depending on how much you can rack up your score through time bonuses, ring bonuses and killing enemies, you'll be graded on your performance on a scale of E to A. If you die, however, your score will be reset, so you basically have to beat stages in one perfect run. Since stages are generally about 5 minutes long, it's not as bad as it might sound. There are a handful of levels where getting the necessary score bonuses can be difficult, but these are few and far between. Some reviewers have used the ranking system as a major criticism, saying that rankings really don't belong in a Sonic game. I disagree. I think they add a lot of replay value to stages that already have 5 missions and multiple pathways, encouraging players to hone their skills and learn the ins and outs of the level design. Sure, getting good ranks in some levels can be very difficult, but Again, nobody seems to mind that about the Bayonetta games. Either way, going after A ranks, just like special stages in the classic series, is completely optional, so it hardly ruins the game as a whole. In terms of content, SA2 is one of the beefiest games in the entire series. And that more or less wraps up my thoughts on Sonic Adventure 2 for the Sega Dreamcast. While others are welcome to disagree, it is my opinion that this game is a considerable improvement over its predecessor. As Sonic Adventure 1 was the series' first successful experiment with 3D, the six gameplay styles could be somewhat shallow and had room for refinement, and that's exactly what Adventure 2 does. It abandons the gameplay styles that didn't work and improves the ones that did, but not without some hiccups along the way. The story is more straightforward and less obtrusive while also sporting a flawed but still improved presentation. Graphically, Adventure 2 is one of the best looking games in the Sega Dreamcast and holds up nicely to this day. In terms of gameplay, all the playstyles see improved level design as well as better integrated upgrades and abilities. Boss battles are actually somewhat decent, seeing as they pose a reasonable challenge for the player. On top of all that, the game features 124 optional missions, a go-kart minigame, a boss rush mode, and a virtual pet simulator. One thing that Adventure 2 doesn't do as well is the soundtrack. I'll give SA1 fans that one. But at the end of the day, the big reason I still prefer Sonic Adventure 2 to the first is because it's simply a much better game as a package and has a lot more replay value. When I play Sonic Adventure 2, I don't have to waste my time running around how worlds, sitting through 7 credit sequences, or watching the same cutscenes up to 4 times. The fact that there are only 3 scenarios that swap off characters between the 30 unique stages maintains a sufficient level of variety that keeps things from dragging on like hour long doses of Amy or Big. While Sonic Scenario and Adventure 1 has debatably the best gameplay between the two games, that's still not enough to make Sonic Adventure 1 a better game as a whole. Sonic Adventure 2 integrates its content into a nice package deal and cuts out all 
the unneeded fluff. And because of that, I find myself wanting to revisit it a hell of a lot more often. That's not to say that Sonic Adventure 2 is a perfect game, or even necessarily as good as the classics. While Knuckles and Rouge aren't as bad as people say they are, they certainly have their issues. There are also a handful of bad levels, like Eternal Engine and Security Hall, as well as some mildly annoying ones, like Egg Quarters. At the end of the day, though, no Sonic game has ever been 100% perfect for everyone, not even the precious classics. If Sonic the Hedgehog CD, which had questionable level design and some really annoying stage gimmicks, can be considered one of the best games in the series, then I don't understand why Sonic Adventure 2 is considered one of the worst by comparison. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Sometimes it's worth taking the bad with the good for the sake of enjoying a game that's worth enjoying, and Sonic Adventure 2 is a game worth enjoying. Yes, the game has aged and there are definitely better 2D and 3D Sonic games out there, but is Sonic Adventure 2 really as bad as all the big reviewers are making it out to be? In my opinion, no. Not even close. Most of their arguments are taken for granted personal preferences of what they think Sonic ought to be, rather than honest, truthful evaluation of the game on its own objective merits. To all those folks out there who dislike this game, or who just prefer Adventure 1, I want you to know that I respect your opinion. It's a perfectly legitimate, reasonable preference to have, and you're free to respectfully express it. But at the same time, those of us who still like Adventure 2 would appreciate it if you'd see shoving the opinions of big reviewers down our throats and calling us nostalgia fags for liking a video game that you don't like. Frankly, I'm rather sick of all the shaming that's been going on for the past three years. SA2 may be a flawed game, but it's still mostly a good one, and there's a lot to like about it if you're willing to give it a fair chance. With all that said, it's time to put an end to this ridiculously long review. Join me next time for the final game in the Dreamcast era, Sonic Heroes for the GameCube, Xbox, and PlayStation 2. Yes, I know it's not a Dreamcast game. I'll explain myself in the next video. Until then, I'm Xperidime Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review.